USA Tonight. Blueprint for change. We did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been gathering over a considerable period of time. The 9-11 Commission report is out more than 500 pages on what went wrong. But will the government make it right? Punishing parents when kids steal cars, Mayor Williams says the parents must pay. But some argue his plan goes after the wrong people and bonding behind bars. Like the first when I gave birth to her, that's the joy I felt. A new twist to summer camp in the nation's capital. From WUSA 9 News, this is USA Tonight with Derek McGinty. Good evening. The 9-11 Commission says our leaders failed to grasp the danger, that the steps they did take were so feeble they failed to even slow the terrorists down. And the Commission says we are still not safe. Commissioners and 9-11 families now begin a long campaign to push the changes they say are essential to make America safer. Bruce LeShan begins our coverage of the final 9-11 Commission report. How much do I miss him? I miss him every single hour of every day. The pain of 9-11 may have eased for some, but not for Rosemary Dillard. What do you say to him about today? That we're getting near. You're going to be able to rest in peace soon. We're getting near. This was a failure of policy, management, capability, and above all, a failure of imagination. Despite repeated warnings going back nearly a decade, the commission says people paid to imagine the worst failed to imagine that terrorists would fly planes into buildings. The warnings, they say, were there during the Clinton administration. The warnings were there during the Bush administration. Brought chills to my body and also anger. The commission blames neither president. But if it happens again, and the commission says that is likely, the American people will blame whoever is president and perhaps his party. And if it happens and we haven't moved, then the American people are entitled to make very fundamental judgments about that. The president is listening. Government needs to act, we will. And so is John Kerry. We can do better. We must do better. And there's an urgency to our doing better. The commission is pushing a series of recommendations, continue to root out terrorist sanctuaries, unify intelligence and planning under a new national counterterrorism center, and unify all the intelligence agencies under a new national intelligence director at the right hand of the president, moves that are supported by most 9-11 families. The true memorial will be when we reorganize the intelligence and security agencies so that people will be safer in the future and maybe other families won't have to go through what we've gone through. But no one is convinced that that will be enough. Senator, do they hate us for who we are or do they hate us for what we do? Do they hate us for our policies? Beats the hell out of me. You just I don't know. I mean, look, some of the scariest uh, things that I saw during this thing were interviews with people who don't hate at all. They just, they're sweet and lovely, and they believe killing infidels is a good thing. But whether it is our freedoms or our policies that cause terrorists to hate us is a bit of a fault line among a commission that was remarkably unified. Vice Chair Lee Hamilton tells me everything from the Arab-Israeli conflict to U.S. support for repressive regimes fuels Arab anger. He says many Muslims admire Osama bin Laden but hate the violence, and he says they are the ones that we have to reach. But well, that was a chilling statement from the former Senator Bob Kerry. He says, I don't know why they hate us. It's the folks that don't hate that make you nervous and afraid that this is coming again. Yeah, and, the, and there really is a disagreement, I think, here between people like Lee Hamilton and, and Bob Kerry. Bob Kerry says it doesn't matter. You could change your tie. You could change everything about you. Could, uh, they would still hate us. Lee Hamilton says things are changing, that... Uh, not because of Osama bin Laden, but for other reasons. We are pulling back from the Saudi Peninsula. That might make a difference. If there's a resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, maybe that would make a difference, too. All right. Bruce Lashan, great job. Thank you so much. And tonight, so we can take a closer look at this 9-11 Commission report, we chat with Professor Yona Alexander. He joins us from New York. He's a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. He's also director of its International Center on Terrorism Studies. Good evening, Professor. This report says the 9-11 attacks were a shock, but they should not have been a surprise, and it goes on to list several things that governments, Clinton and Bush-oriented governments, missed. Everything from the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia to the 2000 attack on the coal that should have warned us, but didn't. Do we know why they didn't warn us? Uh, basically, uh, the problem is that uh, 
there were missteps and missed opportunities by uh, different administrations. One can go back even to the Reagan uh, period when the United States uh, decided to pull out the troops uh, from Lebanon. And um, there are those who would say, uh, let's look at uh, Carter, when Carter um, did not uh, act decisively when the embassy in Tehran was taken over and the United States was held hostage for 444 days. You know, Professor, you make a good so, point there because it seemed to say in the report that because the U.S. didn't strike back after the attack on the coal, that Osama bin Laden may have concluded that such an attack was risk-free, that there would be no reprisal. It's, uh, it goes all the way back. I mean, uh, it seems to me that uh, in order to deal with terrorism effectively, you need a coherent uh, policy, what uh, the government is going to do. Uh, you need an effective organization structure and quality uh, intelligence, strong uh, law enforcement, military response, economic uh, sanctions, uh, and so forth. And unfortunately, uh, every administration uh, did not do the utmost because they considered terrorism to be a nuisance an irritant rather than a major strategic challenge. Now and now, hopefully, with this report, perhaps you can learn the lessons. Well, as you mentioned the lessons, I mean, what the report says was there was a deep fundamental dysfunction in our intelligence services. Do the recommendations out of the report, including this so-called intelligence czar, whatever you want to call it, and the counterterrorism center, do, do those things address that dysfunction to your mind? It's uh, only partly, of course, uh, if you look at the past and we learn from the past, you would find that there were many uh, reports and many commissions, uh, but unfortunately, they were not uh, implemented. And uh, hopefully, uh, these uh, recommendations, which make a lot of sense, for example, on the intelligence level, in order to coordinate and communicate, uh, this makes a lot of sense. But uh, the jury is still out there, and we are not really sure if uh, these recommendations are going to be implemented. Professor Yona Alexander joining us live from New York City. Thank you so much tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that 9-11 Commission final report is out, and guess what? It's already a bestseller. It's on the top 50 list on Amazon.com's bestseller list. Emily Schmidt tells us, shows us what book buyers are hoping to find as they read between the lines. From pictures that at one time were an almost unbelievable story, now come pages of a report that tell even more of the story. I'm fairly impressed with how comprehensive it is, um, telling a very complicated tale. Ron Naveen picked up a copy of the 567-page report prepared for a difficult read. And we have to get above, you know, simple platitudes about whether we're safe or not or getting those bad guys. I mean, it's not that simple very uh, anxious to see what I can find out. Politics in Prose ordered 200 of the books, 50 sold in the first hour. And I think a lot of people are hoping that this is going to be fairly comprehensive and for the first time bring a lot of the information into much larger spotlight instead of being, you know, pardon the pun, but shelved. But the $10 book reminds others of an incalculable cost. I'll read it later. It's, um, I don't have to watch it right away, you know, it's, I don't think it's going to change my opinions. Um, I just feel that it's time to move forward. Pat Emel's husband, Bob, was a defense intelligence agency analyst in the Pentagon on September 11th. She called him when planes hit the World Trade Center and said, I love you. It would be their last conversation. He knew the Pentagon had th the walls were three feet deep. This still this airplane still was able to impact it. So I don't know if there's any way that we can completely stop it, you know, and we're talking about different mentalities. Though some September 11th families of the dead blame bureaucracy for their loved ones loss, okay. Pat refuses to criticize any administration. People would want to hear me say that I won vengeance, but it would be futile. It's not going to bring my husband back. Instead, she says it's important the government move forward following commission recommendations to make the country more secure. All I want is for us to learn from our mistakes. I don't want my husband to have died in vain. I want 
this never to happen again. Pat retired from her elementary school principal job this month. She will remarry this fall. Nearly three years after September 11th, her life is beginning new chapters, just as the commission issues its own words. Emily Schmidt, USA Tonight. And the publishers of that 9-11 report have rolled out between half a million and 700,000 copies of the book. Taking on teen car thieves by targeting their parents. Up next, do laws encouraging parental responsibility really work? You're watching USA Tonight. Nine News is sponsored in part by Hyundai with America's best warranty. I'm meteorologist Topper Shutt. Some heavy showers and thunderstorms now pushing through the metro area. Heavy activity over Bethesda. Most of Fairfax just is left with light to moderate rain, but the heaviest activity from Laurel down toward Upper Marlboro down toward Waldorf. Nothing severe, but rainfall rates two to three inches per hour. We'll take you out with the seven day. We have showers and thunderstorms in much of tomorrow, 84, and also over the weekend. We'll talk more about the weekend tonight on 9 News 11. And Derek will be back after this. Now, here are some of the other stories you need to know about this July 22nd. Remember those extra short subway trains Metro was running after 10 p.m. at night to save money? They're gone. Metro gave up on that plan after riders became furious with overcrowded subway cars. Police in the district call him Baby John Doe, and tonight they're looking for his parents. They say the one-year-old was abandoned, left at a home in the Petworth neighborhood a month ago. You'll see, he seems to be very happy and outgoing, but clearly we want to find his family. Police hope anyone with information on this little boy will give them a call. And there are reports tonight that players for the Montreal Expos have been told there's a strong possibility they'll be playing in our area next year. ESPN Radio says union leaders met with the Expo player representatives and told them there's a probability they'll wind up in either Washington or Northern Virginia. But the players believe the district is the most likely location for the team. Tonight at 11, we'll have the latest developments on this breaking story, including local reaction. Well, D.C. Mayor Tony Williams says he wants to hold parents accountable for the bad behavior of their children, especially those kids who steal cars. Parental liability is nothing new. Laws holding parents responsible became popular in the late 80s and early 90s as the juvenile crime rate began to get out of hand. But some people question these laws, wondering, do they really work? Well, joining us tonight to talk about the mayor's plan, D.C. Councilmember Harold Brazil and Tyrone Parker, Executive Director of the Alliance of Concerned Men. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming in. Well, the mayor says, you know what, one of the things he wants to do, although he's not uh, big on specifics right now, is take driver's licenses away from parents whose kids steals cars. Uh, Councilman, your thought is, why not? I, exactly, why not? And, and if there are youngsters, 16, 17, whatever, that 18 that do have licenses and they get uh, into trouble, take their licenses too. Why not hold the parents accountable? Sounds reasonable to most folks. Sounds interesting. I think the question would be which parent? Do you take the license from a parent that's not there living with the kid or do you take the one that is there living with the kid? You know, because uh, if the kid is not staying with both parents and they have to be staying with one, who license do you take? Well, the question I think more comes down to who is in charge of this kid? If it's the kid's parent who's at home and <laughs> okay. he or she's in charge? then they should, should they pay a penalty when their kid's not doing right? So I think we can begin from that perspective there. Uh, to me, I think the mayor's bill, I think it's an interesting piece. I think that some of the concepts in there can and possibly should be in place. However, when you're talking about penalizing a parent simply because the child is not obedient or the child is not doing 100% of what that parent would like for them to do, I don't think, I think those type of actions are just too extreme. So you think it's not quite fair? Not totally. Council you know, I, it, it's very complicated, obviously, but I mean, what about the parent that's out and they're hanging out or they're doing drugs, they're doing whatever, but they're not taking care of home, they're not taking care of that child, and it's not just stealing an auto. I mean, mm -hmm. what about the upgrading upbringing of the child? What about their education, their homework, their nutrition? Uh, if you're not doing the job parenting, parenting then you ought to be held responsible. Well, and you know, let, let's talk about that because let's be real here uh -huh. for a second. Kids who are being raised right don't go out and steal cars for the most part. There for may the be a few part. aberrations here and there, but most for the most time, what would your dad have done to you if you'd oh, done anything God, like I that? Came back exactly. Yeah. So what's yeah. wrong with telling people, you know, we're not going to tolerate this kind but, of thing? But you know what? And I think it's interesting again because when you start looking, in fact, I was talking to a friend this morning 
and in the same regard to the same man, and point, and point was that the legal aid service sent a number of these kids that do show up for court are accompanied with their parents. You know, so when you start looking at you to, to a large degree, you do have the parents that's basically involved. With okay, so kids. What, what should be done? If that's not the solution, at least part of it, well, what else is out there? Well, I think that what we need to be doing is focusing really on prevention. I think that once we start to really focusing on prevention and basically advising the public and the community, and, and the great idea I saw her mm. was when the insurance company was going to step in and begin to do well, low Well, Councilman, let me, let me throw this out because we had a picture of one of these parks out in that neighborhood and it was vastly in disrepair. And uh, your own colleague, Kevin Chavis, made a phone call to try to get them to come out and fix the thing. Mm -hmm. have the, has the city done its part to make sure that these kids have the right services? Well, I, you know, I think uh, we all in this community have a part. You know, this village, it takes a village to Absolutely. raise a child. Has, it, has the city done enough? No. Are they falling down in some areas? Yes. Are they doing some good things? Yes. There, I, I know there are four new recreation centers. Uh, Sherwood Park is one up in uh, Ward 4. Uh, so we're, we're doing a better job. Are we programming enough? Are we putting enough money, enough uh, people out there uh, uh, with the young people? Mm -hmm. I quite agree. It's on the front end, but, but when they're stealing cars, I mean, they're, they're stealing them, one and two and three and four, and they're getting caught, and they say, Johnny, don't do it again, and they come right back, and they hear, and, Johnny, and, and, don't and do it again. And if you're talking prevention, you who's know? more in charge of prevention? Than the parents. Than the parents. I'm, you know, I'm saying basically, I'm not relieving them of their responsibility. However, I'm keeping it in the All perspective. Right. Something Gentlemen, has to happen. Something no has to happen. And I think the child there. needs and a certain uh, to be dealt with more sternly. Right. And I think the kid, the parents need to come in and they need to share in some of the right. responsibility. You know what? They're going to beat me up if I don't end this. So I got it. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming oh, in. You. We thank appreciate it. Thank you. Next. This is Stacy Cohan inside the D.C. jail. I'll tell you why these inmates and their children are smiling. Next on USA Tonight. New tonight on 9 News. We're closer to a Major League Baseball decision. Players hear word on where they might be playing next year. Plus a harsh report on 9-11. A failure of imagination. The report says the attacks could have been thwarted. 9 News explains how tonight at 11. It is the absolute last place in the world you want to bring your kids, but nine D.C. mothers were thrilled to have their kids there today. Stacey Cohan went behind the bars at the D.C. jail to check out this very unusual mother and child reunion. It was so wonderful. It was like a dream come true. Nothing can express how I feel about it. The wonder in this 10-year-old's life is simply the ability to do this, hug her mother. Joyce Morris has been locked up at the D.C. jail for six months. I was doing drugs, and that, that's all I thought of was drugs. But not today. These inmates are getting a family fix in this first-of-its-kind three-day camp for moms trying desperately to redraw their lives. One of the reasons I didn't want my kids to see me incarcerated is because they see you behind a glass, and they talk to you on the phone, and that's not the way that I want him to remember me. Make that circle right there. Mm -hmm. What does right. it mean to you to be able to be here and touch her and see her? It feels real good, real nice. It's real, real, it's real nice because the jail and never do nothing like this. It's been a good week. But the truth lies behind all of these smiles. In fact, it's right outside this window where curls of razor wire and high walls keep these families apart. In spite of what I've been through, um, I didn't know he admired me that much like that. 14-year-old Samuel gives his mom a reassuring hug. But she knows that a few days of fun can't erase what her mistakes have cost her son. And I thank you for jumping on a positive note. But, you know, how does that make you feel? Samuel doesn't answer. And as this final camp day draws to a close, moms and kids hold nothing back. And you need to know. You've made mistakes, but your weaknesses have helped me grow strong. But the last step takes the most strength. Scarfing down birthday cake in honor of all the real celebrations missed, mother and child say goodbye again. I don't want to say bye. You know that? <laughs> oh, be good. I won't see you till I come home, OK? Because I don't want you coming up here and see me like that. All the moms have left are camp photos and the hope that things will be different when these walls no longer separate them from their children. Mommies make mistakes too, but you'll always be in my heart. And I want you to know that I thank God for blessing me with a brand new start. 
Love always. <laughs> the DC jail camp is sponsored by the Hope House and by the Rebecca Project. The groups have been reunited jail fathers with their kids for years, but this is the first time they've worked with mothers behind bars. Mm. And you know, Stacy, when you first see this story and you're thinking, well, these are, these are some bad women, these are some tough women, but by the end of the story, you're thinking, wow, man, it's a very heartwarming thing. And, and I wonder if that affected you that way. Did you come in with one attitude and change to another? Well, you can't be in that room without getting teared up, but it's interesting. It's three days. Today was the last, and the first day I was told the kids were arms crossed, standoffish with their own parents. And wow. by the end of it, I mean, you saw what happened. It, it was really good for them. Yeah, Stacy Cohen, thank you. So much great conversation. We used up our mailbag time. Too bad, but we'll do it tomorrow. Send us some emails. The address, USA Tonight at WUSATV9.com. Be sure to include your name and where you're from. That's our show. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.